Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. And I'm reading from the NLT. I'm not sure if you guys, are you guys, you want to throw it on the screen? No? Okay, good. Perfect. I'm just going to read it. Verse 11 says, Paul's talking, not that I was ever in need, for I've learned how to be content in whatever I have. Not that I was ever in need. I was, I was there, and, and it may look to you that I needed something, but I'm not, I, really, I was really good. So not that I was ever in need, for I've learned how to be okay. I've learned how to be content in whatever I have. Whatever I had was just going to be enough. Touch your neighbor and say, it is what it is. That I was just okay, and I realized how to just be okay because I just got to the point where I realized that it just it is what it is. Verse 12 says, and I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. But watch this part. It says, I have learned. Everybody say, I have learned. I've learned the secret of living in any and every situation. Is that okay to talk like that here? Oh, thank you. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or with empty, plenty or little, for I can do all things or everything or everything. I can do everything through Christ who gives me the strength to do the everything that I needed to do because he's the one that gave me strength. In fact, he is my strength, but it was him that gave me the strength in order to do it, in order to be okay with it being just the way that it is. And the thing about it is, is that this is not something that you were just born with. This is something that you have to learn, which means that you're not going to always be all right in any and every situation, but this is something that has to be processed in you. This is something that has to be learned. So today, if I can take a title, if I can tag it, if you're going to put something on Facebook, if you want to hashtag something, you know, for the churchgoers, then we're going to talk from this this title called A Joy That Remains. A Joy That Remains. Is that okay? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this time in you. I thank you, God, for being at the meeting place today. And I thank you, God, for the meeting place. And I pray that you would prepare our hearts, God, to hear what you have to say. I pray, God, that you would give me a flow like that river, God, that flows to the very throne room of God. I pray, God, in the name of Jesus, that, God, you would help us to receive what you have to say. Lord, I'm just getting out of the way because, God, they don't need Terrence. They need you. So give them you. In Jesus' name, amen. So. Negative seems to be popular these days. Wouldn't you agree? That negative is very, very popular. In fact, I believe that Christians even promote negativity these days. For example, if you make a, fo- if you make a post on Facebook, if you post something negative, chances are you're going to get more likes, more shares, more comments. But if you post something positive, you may get two of your meeting fa- meeting place friends to, you know, kind of give you a heart, but that's all you get. It seems as though that negativity is not only popular, but it's taken over. And what I mean by that is that people are more interested in your struggle and your complaining. They can, they can connect and they can identify themselves with your anxiety, with your habits, with your hurts, with your hangups. We all want to read books. We all want to watch movies that have something to do with this, with this underdog. Everybody wants to be the fan of this under, underdog that has this negative um, situation, this, this situation of going from calamity to, to success. We all want to hear about the pain. It's, it's what seems to connect people these days. It's, it's almost to the point where Christians can't be honest about God's goodness because we've got to promote the, the, the hell and the strain and the chaos and anxiety that we feel that we, that in our fears that we see and we experience on a day-to-day basis. Why is it, why is it that we have a hard time with just 
talking about God's goodness and how good he is and, and, and the things that are going right. Why, why is it so hard for us to, to, to switch our minds to present God's light instead of talking about the darkness? You see, I even struggle with this. And Fred, I've been in a season where God has been extremely good to me. Extremely good. I'm, I'm, in, I'm living one of those seasons where my eyes couldn't see and my ears could not even hear or, or, or I just couldn't even perceive all of this goodness that God was going to throw on me in this season. But the thing about it is, Vardry, is that, that I've read Ecclesiastes and the part that gets me is that there's a, there's a time for this and there's a season for that. And the thing that scares me the most, Aaron, is that I'm scared that this season is going to change and, and everything that God has given me is going to run out and it's going to be no more. Because my experiences are teaching me that every time something good happens, there's something bad around the corner. Is that anybody? It's like, I appreciate God doing this today, but I'm so concerned about tomorrow. I'm so concerned about well, what's going to happen next that I can't even enjoy God's goodness because I don't feel like his goodness is going to be enough to sustain the next blow that comes to my life. And so here it is. I'm, I'm so nervous about it that what happens is, guys, that I started to get in my feelings. So, Pastor T, I, it's really bad. I started to get in my feelings because I, I feel like God can bless me one time and he can bless me two times. I've, you know, I'm okay with believing that he can take me through the Red Sea and, and, I, and, I, and I can believe him enough for manna, but what I'm having a hard time with is with Jordan. Because when I cross the Jordan, that is, that is God's promises. That is something that is going to remain. That, that is a place where I am settled. That is a place where that, that's actually mine. That is not me wandering through and trying to figure out how to get by. But that right there, that is a called place. That is destiny. That is a destination that God has prepared, prepared before, has, has created for me to live in. And it's a place that I should remain in. But how do, we, how, how do we structure our emotions and structure our minds to get ready for something that we've never experienced when the only thing we've ever experienced was transition? So how is it that we as believers, how do we jump into the world system and start getting in our feelings? Touch your neighbor and just ask them a simple question. Are you in your feelings? You see, feelings, feelings are indicators. Feelings are not facts. And the bottom line is, is that we have feelings and we, and we, take, on, we, we take them on like they're facts. But it's really not a fact. It is just a feeling. For example, we will feel like it's a bad day. It's going to be a bad day. I just feel like it's going to be a bad day. Is it a bad day or do you just feel that way? Because the way you feel doesn't necessarily mean that that's the way that it is. And so the reality of it is, is that our feelings paint images in our head that just may not be true. And see, we have to seek out truth instead of our feelings defining what's real. Because feelings are nothing more than indicators. They're just signals to alert us that something is changing or something is different or something is right or something is wrong. And so the indicator should alert you to seek out the truth in a thing and it should not be defined by the feeling of a thing. Am, am I okay? Because what, what I, I feel like, I'm, I, I, like I really feel God's anointing. I feel, like, I feel like I'm about to really kind of turn on and show you, show you who God is today. So here we go. So feelings... Feelings cannot define our faith, nor can it determine our works. Guys, I want you to understand that the enemy is giving you all of these feelings, that he's, that he's using these feelings to define your faith. And I'm telling you, that cannot be the case because our actions are a reflection of what we believe. That I know by I know what you believe by what you do. You can tell me all day long that you believe that things are going to be good. But if everything that you do is bad, your, your, your actions are now showing me what you actually believe. Because it happens from the inside out. What's in you is going to come out of you. It is not what goes into a man that defiles him, but it was, it's what comes out of a man that defiles him. So your actions is what defines what you really believe. And so what's happening here, guys, is that what's happening 
is that faith without works is dead. So that's why James would say, show me your works and I'll show you what you believe. You can say that you can believe all day long, but your actions and your belief system has to get married and have a baby. And, 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 and it's called purpose. And the reality of it is, when feelings get involved, our feelings misrepresent who we really are and what we believe. Okay, for example, I'm going to help you. This doesn't happen at your church. It happens at another church. It's just an example, hypothetical. Okay? So, Pastor Fred is going to be off. How many weeks? Five. You see, he talks like a pastor, even when he's not preaching. Five. He's going to be out five weeks. Fred chooses five preachers, and he doesn't choose me. What they do that at? They ain't right. So I meet Fred at Walmart. No, Fred, I'm sorry. Fred is bougie. He chops at Target. I meet Fred at Target. Oh, you saw me there too? I know. We're both, <laughs> we're both bougie. I see Fred at Target. Hey, bro, how you doing, man? It's good to see you, man. Yeah, the Lord is coming to take five off, five weeks off, man. Yeah, man. Hey, Fred, okay, cool, man. You need my help? No, nah, man, I'm good. I, I've already found, you know, five other preachers. I got it all lined up. I don't, we don't need you. We don't need you there at the meeting place. It's, it's all right, brother. It's all right. It's all right. Just go teach your Sunday school lesson. You'll be all right. So from that point, I get in my feelings and say, man, why you didn't call me? Or, man, maybe he doesn't think that I'm good enough. Or maybe, maybe... Maybe we're not as cool as we thought, or or maybe I'm not this, or maybe 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 I don't. Man, he can't see Jesus in me. Maybe I'm not. And so what happens is, I st- my feelings get in the way of what's actually true. And so now, here's the example. So I'm in my feelings now. And so now, we, every time Fred makes a post on Facebook, or every time he he, he presents a, a cool little graphic, you know what I'm saying? I just keep stroll. I just stroll faster. You know what I mean? Because I don't want to like it on social media. Okay, so the seed was sown at Target. It's a seed. But then it grew into a fetus. It grew into a fetus, got a little heartbeat. And so when I see him on Facebook, I just stroll past fast. Every time I see him in the police, just, just stroll faster, you know, get it out of my sight. So then when I see him again, I just walk by him and don't speak. Because now the fetus has grown into a child. And so now when we are... So now when people are talking about all the great things you guys are doing at the meeting place, so now the child has grown into an adolescent. And so now I begin to talk about the meeting place and I begin to tear down what Fred is doing in the city because Fred didn't invite me to speak in the, in the five-week opportunity that, that, that I would have to speak at the meeting place. And so now that it's an adolescent and I'm talking about Fred, then when, when, when Fred confronts me and I still didn't deal with that emotion, now it's full grown, it's got a mustache, it's got chest hair, a social security card, and now this feeling is now a permanent citizen in my life. And so now I want to deal with Fred one-on-one. And so now I'm cursing Fred out. I'm calling him everything but a child of God. And I just try to destroy his character. Why? Because I did not deal with the feelings when it was a seed. And now I got to fight a full grown man and you have no idea of why you can't get over things and why you can't get to things and why God can't get stuff to you. It's because you are so wrapped up in your feelings and you don't deal with them. And now your feelings have turned into facts. It's determined your faith and your faith has determined your actions. And now you're totally defined by an emotional state that wasn't even true. Because the reality, the thing about feelings is that feelings are inconsistent. Feelings are like underwear. They change daily. And so here it is. We're trying to be like a consistent God, but we're living under a consistent slave master. You see, feelings, what they do, church, is that They cloud our discernment and our decisions. And so what happens is we have feelings, and what it happens is just feelings just kind of smear, smear the pain. It just just makes everything cloudy to the point where we don't understand really what's flesh, what's spirit, what's soul. 
Because the Bible says that a carnal mind is enmity with God. It says to kill the cravings of the flesh and follow out the spirit. But when we get our feelings involved, because, because that's what we live in, and we live in a world of negativity, and, and, and our feelings attach themselves to the negativity, then what happens is when we're trying to make a big decision, we're trying to choose option A, church. Option A is, I'm going to do the will of God. I'm going to do A. A. Whoa, 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 whoa. But then you second guess because you really don't know what the will of God is. Because you've been driven so much by your feelings and your feelings have been leading you. But now you run to God when there's a situation that you know your feelings can't handle. Now that it's big, now that it's, it's, it's out of your control, now you're in the, in the wilderness experience to the point where you don't know what's right and you don't know what's wrong, you don't know what's left. You're just confused. So now we can't quickly, we can't, we can't just circle A because I, I'm not really sure what God's will is. So then we go to B, which is our feelings, but then we have so many experiences with us following our feelings. Like, oh my God, I'm like, I just don't even trust myself anymore because, I mean, I felt like I was doing the right thing, but I mean, look where I'm at now. So what, like, what, I, I don't know. <laughs> so when A, when you can't figure out what A is, you go to B. And your experiences have shown you that your feelings have messed you up so many times, you're going to do everything in your power not to prevent that from happening again. So then you go to C. What's C? Well, I'm going to call my mom and ask her because I just don't know what God wants. I don't know what I want. And I. So, mom, listen, before you start fussing at me, I've already prayed. I've been going to church the last six weeks. And I just don't know how I feel. I mean, I lift my hands out like this. I lift them straight up. I lay down. I've knelt. I've prayed. So, Mom, what do you think? And so now, when you start seeking the help and the assistance of somebody else, then you give them the custodial responsibility of letting their opinion become truth in your life. And when you start following the opinions and, 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 and mindset and, and perspective of someone else, you are now attached to that destiny. So my thing is simply this, is that we've got to get out of our feelings, church, so that we can, so that we can effectively understand what truth is. Because the Bible says that the word of God, it is quick. It is like a sword that it divides the, the soul and the spirit. It gets down even into the very um, depth of the marrow of the bone that it divides everything. It shows you what's real. It shows you what's fake. It shows you what God wants. It shows you what you want. It shows you. It divides everything and it makes everything so clear. That's why Jesus says that I am the light of the world, that the word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. God is trying to expose the truth, but your feelings is getting in the way of the light. That your feeling is it's acting as a filter. So every time God speaks truth or a word of prophecy comes forth or, or, or somebody says something with the mic, you think it's your word, but you, but you filter the word with your feelings. That God's light shouldn't be filtered. So what's happening is, Fred, that the church... We're in filling, we, 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 we've, we've created filling prevention. That's what we're doing. It's filling prevention. I go to this church because it makes me feel good. And everybody in here is safe and it's good and everybody's in filling prevention mode. What do you mean, preacher? I simply mean this, that we are more concerned about not, we are more concerned about not getting hurt again than we are doing the will of God. You see, emotions are tied to experiences, and as soon as a current situation reminds us of a negative experience, we will take on the emotions of a previous experience, and we will do anything in our power to prevent it from happening again because our feelings is priority. So everything about our life is preventing feelings. 
And so we come to church like this is a YMCA where everybody gets a trophy and nobody can be real. Nobody can be accountable. Nobody can fully worship God and lay down and lay their burdens down because I am too worried about my feelings. I'm worried about how I feel about the way you think about me and, and how it feels. I'm just too concerned. But I want to let you know, I know you've never heard me. I know you don't know me and I know I'm being real with you, but God does not care about your feelings. We can't be in feeling prevention. And I know that it's easier to talk to your brothers and sisters about the struggle because it's the struggle that connects us. I know it's easier to talk about what we don't like. I know it's easier to do those things because there is a fear that if I tell you that I'm really doing good, then we may not have nothing in common anymore. I want to let you know, and I'm feeling kind of baptist right now, so, so don't let these jeans fool you. The best thing that can ever happen to you is for you to discover that you're really uncommon. As soon as you realize that you're not like everybody else, congratulations, you just stepped into Christian world. You just stepped into the kingdom of God. God did not make you to be like everybody else. He says, be ye, he says, come from among them and be ye separate. God wants you to be uncommon. He wants you to be peculiar. He wants you to be unorthodox. That's what makes you different. That's what makes you unique. And when you get into your uniqueness, that's when your anointing comes. And when the anointing comes, that's just when you can start breaking other people's yokes. When, you're st when you become good with, with you and you become good with who God is and you start doing things your own way. And you know what? Here, 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 here's a PSA. Here's a public service announcement to the meeting place. I didn't have this on my notes. I'm not going to charge you for the extra meat, but I do like good gravy. So here we go, guys. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, God, I feel my help. Here we go. So what, what we got to do is that we've got to stop. We got to stop. We got to start looking for blue water. Everybody say blue water. We got to start looking for blue water. Blue water is that deep place. God is calling us to launch out into a deep, to a place that we've never been before. God is calling us to a place where the water is blue. And I know it's deep, and I know it's away from, away from your comfort zone, but I'm telling you, you got to stop trampling around in muddy water. The reason why the muddy is water, uh, the, the, the water is muddy, rather, is because everybody's walking there. Stop walking where everybody's walking. That's why you're so negative, because you got mud on your feet. You're around everybody else doing the same stuff thinking things that everybody else is doing. I'm going to let you know, church, today, God is calling you to a new place. And yeah, it's going to be scary. Yeah, it's going to bring on, along anxiety. But when you have a great risk, you will have a great reward. And if you're ready for the rewards and the promises of God, somebody shout like you want. We're going to use Nehemiah as an example, and I'm going to let you, get, I'm going to let you, let you have your Sunday back. Nehemiah, in chapter 1, his brother came to him, and Nehemiah asked his brother, Hey, man, how are things going back in the hood? How, how Frank you been doing since he got out? What Junebug up to? And so then his brother said, Man, things aren't going well. Been a lot of trouble, man. Man, you know what, man? Everybody walking around with their head down. I mean, they're disgraced, man. They're ashamed. The wall torn down. Gates burn up. Man, it ain't the same, man. It's just not the same. It's bad. Like, you should see him. Nehemiah got sad. The Bible says that he wept. Bible says that he mourned. Bible said he fasted. Then it says that he spoke to the Lord. So hold up. Nehemiah got into his feelings. He didn't like the news. He, he got into his feelings, but then he didn't let his feelings keep him in that place. Because it said that he wept, he mourned, he fasted for several days, but then he went to go seek the Lord. Nehemiah got bad news. He found out about the situation. 
He, he found out through his brother. He didn't find out like you from Matt Lauer on the Today Show. He didn't find out by Savannah. He didn't find out by um, well, Chanel. I like Chanel. But anyways, he didn't, everybody's getting this bad news from all these different sources. It affected him. But he didn't stay there, and he didn't let that moment define him, but he used that to go to God. So then, he gets into the presence of God, what, what Pastor Fred was saying, because it wasn't about the performance, it was about his presence. Because the presence is what dictates how we perform when we leave his presence. But we're over here in our feelings, trying to get in the presence of God, and we're trying to feel God's presence. There's a difference in feeling God's presence and being in God's presence. I don't feel like praising God. I don't feel like worshiping. I don't feel the song. I don't feel the music. I don't, I'm just not feeling it today. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. That I don't have to worry about my, I, I, I got to be where God is. And if, if I'm where God is, then God is going to tell me how to feel about the news that I just got. Because the way that I feel about it may not be the way that he feels about it. And if I'm more concerned about how he feels, then I'm going to take on his feelings. And then he's going to tell, tell me what to do and how I should perform. Because I know that God wants me to do something because it wouldn't affect me if he didn't want me to do nothing. Oh, my God, I'm having so much fun, but I feel like you're bored. And I don't know what to do. So here it is. A lot of us are trying to discover purpose, but your purpose is wrapped up in a problem. Your purpose is wrapped up in a problem. And so if you really want to know what you're supposed to be doing, what is the thing that frustrates you the most? What is the thing that gets on your nerve? What is the thing that you just cannot stand? The Lord has given you a holy frustration to push you to his presence to get the wisdom and to get the assignment so that you can perform in the earth, so that you can fix the problem. Because there's a nation, there's a city, there's a boy, there's a girl, there's a marriage, there's an opportunity, there's a business that is waiting on you. And you're not going to know how to do it if you are in your feelings you'll think you know how to do it that's why God can't even tell you everything because you'll put your feelings on it God doesn't want this meat smothered with gravy this time I know that's how you used to eat it but guess what God wants you to grill it this time with a little Worcestershire sauce he wants you to get away from 57 maybe there's a new concoction that he wants to give you I'm telling you your future is not like your past and I can be excited about it all by myself because he's waiting on you to get to him and get out of that. Man, I'm happy in Jesus this morning. So Nehemiah gets the bad news. He goes to God. And you know what he did? It wasn't even his fault. But he starts out by saying, God, we messed up. We messed up. Nehemiah took ownership and said that, Lord, we as a people have sinned against you. I'm a part of the problem. But Lord, I want to be a part of the solution. He said, you remember what you told, you, you remember what you told your boy Moses? You told him that if, if we return to you, then you will return to us. And so God, if you did it for him, then Lord, you can do it for me because it's impossible for you to lie. So everything you say is eternal and it's not wrapped up in the season. I'm having so much fun in the Holy Spirit this morning. I should do this more often. So he prays to God and he says, God, all I need is your favor. So what Nehemiah did, and I'm about to get you to your, I'm about to get, I'm about to get you to your baptism. What he did was he went to his boss, Vardra, and he asked for a vacation time. To pursue his passion, he, he uses vacation time to pursue his passion of being compassionate to Jews. 
I'm trying to get down my list, but I've got to say this for the sake of Aaron being here. You know what I'm saying? God will give you a com- give, give you a passion to push you to compassion. Because if you're going after your passion to please yourself, then, then that passion can easily turn you into idolatry. Because the thing that he's driving you to, you put that before him. Because he never blesses you for you. He always blesses you for somebody else. That's why he would say to love others as you love yourself. So the thing that you would have did for yourself to turn that in for somebody else. Oh, my God. Man, do you feel this thing up here? You better go back. It's scary up here, man. I feel like the smoke is about real smoke. Not, not the fault. Real smoke. It's about the, like I feel God so much right now. So what, ha- what happens is the thing that you're passionate about is really not for you. That God is giving you this burst of emotion to, to be a problem solving in the earth. The worst thing that could have happened, happened. Man sinned. God told him not to. That was the worst thing that could have happened to the world, right? But God had already had a problem solver in place to deal with the problem. His name was Jesus. And so Jesus came to the earth to solve a problem. And guess what? Jesus didn't like the way it felt. But guess what? He still did it because he was thinking about you. He was compassionate. He saw people without a shepherd so therefore he died and he hung and he bled but guess what he rose again why because he was here to solve a problem and so his passion turned into co-passion for us and so and so that was real weird dude (laughs) and so um and so here it is nehemiah sees the people that's depressed that's down and He goes to God with this overwhelming passion to do something about it, and he has to get out of his feelings. And so he asks his boss for vacation time in order order for him to be compassionate to the Jews. Then he took on a task that seemed impossible. Now, you want to know when God really called you to do something? When you don't feel like you can do it. If God told you to do something that you can do without him, that wasn't God. You guys going Methodist on me, but that's that's cool. That's cool. That's cool. I got you. I got you, boo. I got you. Third thing. Then he had to fight a government or a system that said that this negativity is normal. He had to he had to face a government or a system that said that this is normal and it's acceptable for this group of people. I'm talking about this group of people to be without hope. What, what are you doing? Why, why are you trying to change this? It's always been this way. These people have always been there. Why are you trying to reach people? These are the outcasts, okay? What are you doing? So now he's dealing with a governmental system, you know what I mean, that said it's okay. And it's acceptable for them not to have a place of their own. Then, number four, he had to trust God with the resources to fix the problem. So he didn't start going to people saying, all right, y'all, we're trying to raise this money because um, we're trying, we trying, um, we trying to do this for the peoples. So if, if, if everybody can just give $25, you know, that'll be more than enough for us to uh, um, carry out the task, right? Mm-hmm. He didn't do that. He went to Jira. He went to Jehovah. He went to God and asked God for the resources. It is God's responsibility to tag the person that's supposed to give it to you. It is not your responsibility to go tag somebody and ask them for it. It's your responsibility to go ask God. He says you have not because you ask not. You're asking the wrong people. And as soon as you ask somebody for something, then you now become a slave to it. But guess what? Grace is when you ask God and then he sends you to go tell the person that the Lord has need of this coat. I don't care if you like it. I'm having fun. So here we go. Then he had to build the wall. He went to the hood. He started building the wall with much opposition. He had distractions. He had negative, um, negative comments. There were conspiracies um, to bring confusion and to kill him. Then he had to deal with internal issues with the people they was trying to help, making it hard on him because they're sitting up here enslaving each other. Where do you see that at, church? Mm, not ours. 
you know, theirs, right? So, you know, and so now, instead of building a wall to do some good, now he has to come down to start dealing with the Jews, enslaving each other, and charging them high interest, trying to get over on each other. And so then, not only that, he had to deal, he had to start defending his own intentions. Here it is, he's trying to do something good. Now people are questioning his intentions. So every time you start doing something good or something that somebody else thought they should have been doing, now they're calling out your integrity. So now he had to deal with the intentions of his good deeds because people start lying on him and question his integrity. But guess what? He still finished the wall in 52 days. Praise God, right? He rebuilt the city, and that should be enough, right? That's what he set out to do. But he wasn't finished there because just because you rebuild something, just because you feel like it's over, guess what? God is a more than enough God. He's, he's, he's always a God of excellence. He's always going beyond that your mind can ever think. He's always going beyond what you think you should have been doing. So guess what? Nehemiah took the next step, got with Ezra the priest, and said, read the word of the Lord to the people now. They got a place that they can call their own, and so everything looks good in the physical, but their spiritual is still jacked up. He said, read the word of God to them. And the Bible says that he started reading the word of God in, in chapter 8, verse 9. It says this. He said, the, the word of the Lord uh, was read, and then they wanted to be sad. They were still on their feelings. They were stuck and being inferior, hopeless, and ashamed. But Nehemiah had to define the moment for them. Guys, we're in the negative so much. We're so negative, and that's our world so much that you don't even know when God is really answering your prayers, that you can't even celebrate. You don't even know the times to shout. You don't even know the times to give thanks. You don't even know the times to give and to sow because God is answering our prayers, and here it is. It's a good moment, and even though things were restored in the natural, they were still struggling spiritually and because they could not clearly define the hand of God. They could not um, clearly um, articulate and perceive where grace was because they were still stuck in this negative, miserable, low-down, inferior place. But Nehemiah had to define the moment by saying in verse number 9, he says, don't mourn, don't weep on such a day as this. What are you doing? For today is a sacred, is a sacred day before the Lord. For the people had all been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. And Nehemiah continued and said, go and celebrate. What are you doing? Get yourselves up. Why are, you, why are your heads still down? He said, go and celebrate a, with a feast of rich foods and sweet drinks. He said, look, don't bring out the cheap meat. This is not time for bologna sandwiches. This is not time for treat meat. This is the time for you to go get a T-bone. This is the time for you to go and live your life like a king. What are you waiting for? Guess what? I know that that's what you used to have to do. I know in Egypt you had to eat the leeks and the radishes and all of that, but you're free now. What are you doing? You're supposed to be enjoying the best of God, but you're even though you're here, you're still living back there. You're supposed to be celebrating. He said, go share gifts of food for people who have nothing prepared. This is a sacred day before the Lord. Do not be dejected and sad. Why? Everybody say why. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. I said the joy of the Lord is your strength. It is time for you guys to get joyful, and I know that you've hit rock bottom before, but that was the best thing that could have ever happened to your life because when you hit rock bottom, you just hit Jesus. And when you got to that low place and you couldn't go any lower, that's when you met Jesus because he is the rock. He is the rock of our salvation, but he didn't let you stay there because we we are buried with him, but we're also raised with him. And it is time for us to give up, get up, and start living in this joy. And I want to let you know, baby boy, baby girl, that this thing, it is going to remain. That this is not your Red Sea experience. This is your Jordan experience. This right here is going to remain. God is consistent. His ways are consistent. And even if it doesn't look good, it is good because it has to work out for my good. That's why I do good even when I want to do bad and every time I want to do bad evil is present but it, even though it changed how I feel it's not going to change what I do because I'm, I believe that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living that's why I don't give up that's why I don't faint because I still have a joy that will always remain Amen. 
We're not a people without hope. Therefore, we need to go around spreading the good things. Even if it seems like nothing is going good in our life. Start telling stories about other people as if it is yourself. We got to think on those things that are good, that are lovely, that have a good report. That we've got to change our minds about how we see the situation. Because the only thing that's killing our faith is what we see. What you see, that's the opposite of faith. It's not the fear. Preachers have been, preachers have been saying that fear counsels faith. No, because Jesus had that same fear and that same anxiety. But he believed, therefore he did in spite of the fear. So I'm not suggesting to you that living in the deep blue water is easy. But what I am saying is that if you get out there, you're going to inspire other people to leave the muddy water and to join you out there. You may have to go alone first. But guess what? You're church planners. That's what church planners do. And so when you get over trying to be like other churches, when you get over the fact that everybody else gets to do this, and start thinking and praising God that you get to be uncommon, that you have an uncommon vision, an uncommon mission, an uncommon pastor, an uncommon first lady. I don't know what you call her. Aaron. You have an uncommon Aaron. You can start to do uncommon things because that's what Jesus was. He was uncommon. And people criticize things they don't understand. But it's okay. Nehemiah was criticized. Just know that you're to be busy taking Jericho. It wasn't easy. But guess what? They had a permanent place and a permanent residence. They had a permanent promise. And when God gives you something, you've got to manage it. You've got to manage it doesn't mean that when you get to this great place, this place that you had to learn how to get to, doesn't mean that you won't have ups and downs. It just means that you can be consistent and stable. And now you can control your days instead of your days controlling you. God has called us to take dominion in the earth, which means that we're supposed to take space and territory. That we're supposed to run it and rule it the way that he would. That's how his kingdom is established in the earth. So my challenge is for you to control your feelings. Maybe your wife didn't mean it the way she sounded. Get your feelings in check. I know it seemed like your kids are being disrespectful or they're acting out. But deal with your emotions so that you can ask the right questions. We have no clue of what they're going through and what they're dealing with. You don't know what kind of day they had at school. I know that nobody, as a parent, none of us deserve to be disrespected. I get it. But don't meet somebody Don't meet somebody with their same emotions. Be different. Surprise them. Bless those that curse you. Love your enemies. You're in control. God has given you the keys to the kingdom. God bless you. Thanks for being here today.